Crusader Kings 3 and basically all games made by Paradox Interactive suffer from gameplay typically looking like a big map with tons of text and not much else. And yet one will find several of these games in Steam's list of most played titles. To continue my mission statement of demystifying games, I will do my best to resolve this enigma starting by asking and answering the question, what is Crusader Kings 3 and why is it fun? At their core, the games all work the same way. They take an interesting time in human history, and they combine it with rich game mechanics that are quite intertwined to provide a sandbox where interesting things can happen. These games cover almost 2,300 years of human history, beginning with the Roman Republic and ending in the Second World War. The games feature a very rich simulation that consists of hundreds, thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of independent actors that often have the same capability as the player, leading to unpredictable, sometimes amusing, sometimes frustrating experiences. Crusader Kings 3 covers most of the medieval era in Europe, Northern Africa, and West to Central Asia. If you've seen the show Vikings, you'll be somewhat familiar with the great Viking Ragnar Lothbrok, who was executed by English lords in 865. His sons are retaliating by mounting a great invasion of England. This is where the game starts, in 867. You can choose to start playing as any one of the characters in the entire simulation. For example, as one of the invading Vikings, Ivar the Boneless or Halfdan Whiteshirt, or as one of the defending English lords such as Earl Alfred. If you don't care much for Vikings in England, you could also for example try forming the Holy Roman Empire as King Louis II or Ludwig the German. You can and should find your own goals. There's no win conditions, and the only way to lose is to no longer have any living members of your dynasty. While the initial conditions of the simulation try to be somewhat close to real history, there's no guarantee for how things will unfold. The game is simply a sandbox, and it's up to you to play with it. With this video, I want to help make it clear why it's not just a map with tons of text, but a sandbox that is ripe to create interesting stories and fun experiences. The world of Crusader Kings 3 is split into small areas called counties. Counties combine with each other to make a duchy, duchies combine to make a kingdom, and kingdoms combine to make an empire. To give a concrete example, the city of Vienna as we know it lies in the county of Wien. Together with many other counties, they make up the Duchy of Austria. The Duchy of Austria, along with other duchies, make up the Kingdom of Bavaria, which in turn is part of the Holy Roman Empire. Each piece or group of land may only ever be held by one character at a time, but a character may hold multiple pieces or groups of land. So if we look at King Philippe of France, He's at the same time also the Count of Ile-de-France, Brie Française, Be -be 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 <sighs> Beaumont and Orléans. Should King Philippe die, his heirs will take over. But we'll talk about inheritance a bit later. The entire simulation in Crusader Kings 3 revolves around characters, which are first and foremost defined by their dynasty or bloodline. Whenever a new child is born, it will typically enter the dynasty of the father. The education that he or she get, as well as a bit of luck, affect what kind of traits they get, how their skills turn out, and what kind of religion and culture they have. These properties of characters can and will change over time. There's also congenital traits, so traits that are passed on through genes, both positive and negative, and incest within one bloodline will lead to an increased frequency and intensity of negative traits. Each character in the game has five skills, and each skill is associated with three skill trees. Diplomacy makes it easier to positively interact with other characters, changes how willing they are to accept certain proposals from you, the martial skill is good for fighting wars, and maintaining a good control of your territory. Stewardship helps you with taxes from your domain and building new buildings. Intrigue allows for a more subtle playstyle based around schemes and plots and can help you out when all that stands between you and the throne is the death of your brother. And the last skill, learning, helps with various things such as your piety, can support you with your health, and is quite useful if you want to develop your culture. The things you can unlock in the skill tree range from simple bonuses such as improving the effectiveness of your armies or increasing the amount of taxes that you receive. But there is also more active bonuses. The martial skill tree will unlock the ability to challenge your rivals to single combat, while stewardship will give you the ability to demand payment from characters that you have an influence over, which is naturally the case with your other dynasty members, or if you uncover a secret from somebody else and blackmail them successfully. What happens when your character dies is unfortunately quite complicated. Depending on the so-called succession or inheritance law, the land that your character held prior to death 
will be distributed among the eligible heirs, which are your children, if you have any. In the beginning of the game, the succession law will most likely be some form of partition. If your highest title is, for example, king, and you only hold one king title, then you have nothing to worry about. However, if you rule multiple kingdoms, each one of your eligible heirs will be given one of them, meaning that when you continue playing as the heir, you will only have control of a fraction of your previous lands. You'll still have a claim to all the other kingdoms, and you can wage war for them against your siblings if you want to. However, it's usually a good idea to think about inheritance long before you die. Especially to new players, this system can definitely feel a bit arbitrary and frustrating, but nevertheless, it helps prevent things from being stale and makes it harder for any character to snowball. Plus, it adds more opportunities for, for example, murder plots to get those annoying siblings out of the way. Every character always has one culture associated with them, which defines cosmetic things such as what they look like and whether a count is called a sheikh, a jarl, or simply a count. But more importantly, each culture unlocks so-called innovations individually, the closest analogy to which would be a technology, making the culture a type of tech tree of sorts. When new innovations are discovered, every character who is a member of this culture will benefit from them equally. The benefits include passive bonuses, but can also unlock new building options, stronger military units, or new inheritance law. The most powerful member of the culture will automatically be assigned to be the so-called culture head, giving them the ability to decide which innovation should be focused on. If the culture head has a high learning skill and even unlock the appropriate things in the skill tree, innovations are unlocked significantly faster, which can make a huge difference later down the line. This creates situations where you may want to use your current character to become the culture head, for example through conquest, while educating your heir to have a high learning skill, so that he or she can research innovations later down the line. Beside the culture, there is also the matter of religion. Religions can dictate quite a lot of things. For example, they usually favor men over women. Some force you into monogamy, while others encourage you to have multiple spouses. The Norse religions will consider human sacrifice to be fantastic, Others might tend towards cannibalism, and so on. The beautiful thing is that you as the player, should you become pious enough, can reform a religion and create your own. One of the most satisfying things that I've ever done was to play as a Viking warrior, capture tons of prisoners during my conquests, and make grand sacrifices out of them. I ended up sacrificing something like 85 prisoners to the gods, which resulted in a really high amount of piety. I then used this piety to reform the Norse religion. Because I had already conquered so many of the Norse regions, I could force my vassals, many of them my children or my grandchildren, to convert to the new faith. One of the biggest changes I made was equal rights for men and women. Suddenly, the available pool of competent personnel was doubled. Because finally, I could employ women in my armies, or allow them to become my field marshal. And the entire culture was suddenly significantly stronger than anybody else. Most religions in the game consider every single other religion to be some form of hostile, which allows you to launch holy wars to conquer lands from somebody you consider to be a heretic or infidel. As mentioned earlier, the properties of a character will change over time. The way that the game conveys these changes to you is through these text-based dialogue boxes that will describe to you what happened, who was involved, and give you one or more ways to react, along with the consequences of those actions. Some events may ask your character to spend money, for example to buy more alcohol for a feast or to finance a marriage. If your character, however, is greedy, they can still spend the money, but will incur a stress penalty for doing so. This is the game's way to make sure that you at least loosely follow your character's personality when it comes to these decisions. If your stress levels go too high, you will have a mental breakdown. You'll either have to adopt some type of coping mechanism, which are predominantly negative traits, or choose to ignore the breakdown, which incurs even more stress. The higher your stress level, the bigger the penalty on your health, eventually leading to your death. It's fairly easy to build up stress, but it's significantly harder to decrease it. I'll never forget this match I played, where I set myself the goal of getting as many good genes as possible into my dynasty's bloodline. Everything was going great, until one of my loved ones died, and I incurred so much stress that I had a mental breakdown. I chose to accept a rakish trait, meaning my character spent a lot of time in the brothel, and continued with my game. Another character tried to seduce me, and I figured I might as well accept, because it would mean a further decrease of my stress. Unfortunately, I didn't notice that my visit to the brothel gave me an STD called lover's pox, and the person that seduced me was my son's wife. Before I knew it, I gave the STD to her, she gave it to her husband, my son, they had children, which inherited the STD, and then my son slept with his brother's wife, giving the STD to her, 
then their children got it, and suddenly my plan of a perfect bloodline with perfect genes was completely destroyed. Now I'm not gonna lie, it was frustrating, but at the same time, it's stories like these that are memorable and worth sharing. Crusader Kings 3 really is at its best, when you come up with your own fantasies to live out and your own goals that you want to achieve. For some this will mean roleplaying their character in accordance with the personality traits that they have, for others it might be more mechanical goals such as attempting a world conquest, dominating the realm through only intrigue and schemes, or building up the perfect bloodline. Others might be interested in alternative history scenarios, maybe trying to unify Africa, or play as one of the nations in the Middle East and launch crusades against Europe instead of being at the receiving end. Just define your own goals and playstyles, get hyped up, live out your fantasies, ride the flow, and see what kind of interesting stories the simulation spits out. And should you get bored anyway, try out the multiplayer. What can further help you with imagination and fantasizing are mods. There's a ton of them, and they're easily available through the Steam Workshop. If you're a fan of Lord of the Rings, try out the Realms in Exile mod. You can for example play as Denethor, the steward of Minas Tirith, play as Sauron, or just simply play as the Uruks of Mordor. Mods not only add new cosmetics to transform the world or make it more believable, they can also add new events and stories, or even entirely new mechanics. If you're into vampires, I heavily recommend the Princes of Darkness mod, based on the World of Darkness universe, which you may be familiar with from the fantastic game Vampire the Masquerade. The mod adds vampires that cannot die from old age, adds a feeding mechanic, the ability to turn humans into vampires, blood magic, vampire politics and conflict between the vampire clans, and the existence of an inquisition that hunts the supernatural. These are just two examples. Mods simply help you play the game in a way that's fun to you, but they're by no means a necessity. But let's face it, the best imagination and fantasy are worth absolutely nothing if you don't understand how to play the game. So let's talk about the difficulty and learning curve. Thankfully, there is an in-game tutorial that guides you through the very basics of the game. There's many quite complicated and hard to understand terms in the game. For example, what does de jure mean? What is a claim? What is renown? And how is it different to fame? What is piety? What is a great holy war? And so on. If you hover over many of the important terms, you get a brief summary from the wiki directly in the game itself, and can even hover over terms used in the wiki entries to open another wiki box to explain those new terms. This really reduces frustration and helps remind you what certain words and terms mean easily. At the top of the screen, you'll find a suggestion box at all times. It will tell you if one of your children is still unmarried, if you hold enough land to become a king, if there's prisoners that you could ransom, if there's alliances you could make, and more. The suggestion box genuinely alerts you to the things that you should be aware of, which makes the game feel significantly less overwhelming. Nevertheless, the intricacies of the mechanics and how they are interconnected only open up to you after many hours of playtime. But thankfully, the game is actually quite easy, in the sense that it's difficult to lose at it. It's a good balance of making the game not so frustrating, while still allowing for a reasonable and meaningful skill ceiling where you can actually achieve more things if you understand the game better. In my eyes, this is what makes Crusader Kings 3 one of the easiest Paradox Interactive games to start playing, and one of the best ways to start trying out the genre of grand strategy. Thanks for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it. I know everybody says this, but it would really help me out if you could leave me a like and maybe even a comment if you have some feedback or questions, and consider subscribing if you like my style of content. Also, there should be a link on the screen for another video of mine, so click that if you're interested. Thanks a lot and have a wonderful rest of your day.